Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Ms. Campbell, would you call the roll for us? Mr. Hannigan? Here. Mr. Derman? Here. Mr. Loeb? Here. Mr. Harrell? Here. Mrs. Tipton? Mr. Jeter? Mrs. Seeley? Here. Mrs. Mullet? Present. Mr. Betancourt? Here. Mr. Womack? Here. Mr. Panks? Here. Mr. Lamarck? Here. Mr. Alfred? Here. Mrs. Belisario? Mrs. Heinz? Here. Thank you very much. Would you please stand and join me for the invocation and pledge? <laughs> Heavenly Father, as our school system begins their Thanksgiving break, we ask that we all pause and realize that by your graces we have the blessings we have in our lives. We also ask that our board members will listen tonight to the information provided for us and remember to act on what is best for the children. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> looks like we have several visitors in our audience tonight. If you're a student at one of our universities here for a, a class, would you please raise your hand for me? Ooh. <laughs> we welcome you here this evening. We didn't have anyone sign up for a time on the agenda, so we'll move on to approval of the minutes from the meeting held on October 18th, 2012. Do I have a motion to accept those minutes? Second. Have a motion and a second. Any comments from board members? Any comments from the public? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Mm -hmm. Abstain? So ordered. That brings us to item number six, which is our human resources. We have a recruiting report from Mrs. Dangerfield this evening. At this time, I would like to share information with you pertaining to our 2012 recruitment report being presented tonight by our Human Resources Department. Before we get into the information pertaining to recruitment, I always like to start with our goal, which is to recruit, employ, develop, and re uh, retain a workforce that achieves the mission of our school system. Now let's take a look at our 2011-2012 recruitment initiatives. And as we look at our initiatives, we're going to break it down into two parts. Part one is recruitment, and we're going to highlight recruitment fairs, high school career fairs, advertisement, our student teachers, as well as our high school teaching academy conference. And part two of our report is going to highlight retention information beginning with the minority teacher reception, our expression sessions, community ambassador, as well as cultural competency. Recruitment fairs. In addition to the recruitment fairs that we participated in uh, during 2011-2012, we did advertise our job fair on the Teach Louisiana website. But in addition to that, as you can see, we visited several colleges and universities looking for those shining stars to educate our kids in our classrooms. Our second initiative is an advertisement. We placed an ad in the Teachers of Color magazine. Our next initiative focus, focuses on our student teachers. Let's begin with the fall of 2011. We had 65 student teachers from nine different universities. Out of the 65, we had 28 who applied, and out of the 28 to apply, we had seven that we hired. In the spring of 2012, we had 74 student teachers from seven different universities. Out of the 74, we had 33 who applied, and out of the 33, we had nine of them that we hired. 
I have been tracking student teacher data since 2006, and 74 is the largest amount of student teachers that we have had in our district in a given semester. And our last recruitment initiative is our high school teaching academies, which happens to be my favorite, and we held our annual Teaching Academy Conference on November 8th of 2012. We had approximately 90 high school students who were in attendance sharing their love of teaching. Our theme for this year was teaching is fantastic. And we focused on the small world ant, word ant in the theme and we had our picnic theme for this year. Here you can take a sneak peek into some of the activities that took place um, in our general session. And if you look carefully, you may see a few baseball players. What's a picnic without America's favorite pastime of baseball? So the students from Mandeville High School, they came and prepared, ready in their gear for the activities for that day. While attending the conference, our high school students participated in many breakout sessions. Two of those sessions included Tamara Myers speaking on classroom management, as well as Carrie Sue, who spoke about special education. In reviewing our evaluations for the Teaching Academy Conference, we had a lot of good results from these two sessions. And I think the thing that we got out of these two sessions the most is that definitely the information that they receive can be used in their classroom as teachers, but it can also be used as they build relationships with their peers on their individual high school campuses. And of course, we know the students love technology, so they were engaged in two technology breakout sessions as well. Now let's turn our focus to our retention initiatives. Our first one was our Minority Educators Welcoming Reception. We held that on September the 22nd in 2012. Our theme for this year was connecting new teachers to our school community. We had almost 100% of the new teachers that we hired in attendance. While at the reception, they had an opportunity to meet our superintendent. They had an opportunity to meet his leadership team, other administrators in the district, as well as um, other employees, and most importantly, our community. And our very own Mr. Byron Williams brought words of wisdom for our participants on this day. Our second retention initiative is our expression sessions. And we usually hold about three to four of those a year. And our first one was held on October the 29th of 2012. So what is an expression session? And that's an opportunity given to minority teachers where they come together to discuss a variety of topics pertaining to teaching in our school system. In addition to that, it provides an opportunity for them to focus on enhancing their experiences, discussing challenges, as well as celebrating successes. And here you see two of our minority teachers engaged in an activity. Our theme for that day was building connections through communications. And our presenter was Charlotte Tillman. She's the principal at Pineview Middle School. And if you're wondering why they're not facing each other, it's because they are focusing on their listening skills. And we know that listening is a very important part of communication. Our next initiative is our Community Ambassador Program. We held our annual Community ba Ambassador Meeting on November the 12th of this year. Our program consists of 39 community as well as school leaders. At this meeting, I provided them a recruitment report. Our superintendent provided them a school system overview. And Dr. Davis shared information with them pertaining to cultural competency. And then our last um, retention initiative focuses on cultural competency. This year, our school, th school system's theme is community connections. And with the theme of community connections, we gauge engaged our leadership, which concluded our principals, assistant principals, and central office level leaders in activities that focused on cultural competency. The more that we are aware of differences, we understand those differences, then the better we can work together to build a greater St. Tammany. And in closing, 
I would like to introduce you to the 21 new minority teachers that we hired this school year. Would you explain to me a little bit more about what does cultural competency mean? Cultural competency, cultural competency is about gaining awareness of diversities within groups of people. A little bit more. It's um, there's when we met this summer at our administrators conference, there were some standards um, that were adopted by social, National Social Workers Association, and it was from those uh, standards that we developed um, 
activities to engage our administrators in so they could become aware of the different standards. And for example, one of the standards was ethics and values. Another one would be self-awareness. So throughout the conference and throughout this year, we are gauging our administrators in those standards by engaging them in activities at our monthly principals meetings. Good. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Alfred. Thank you, Mrs. Hines. Um, and, and thank you, um, Mr. Dangerfield. Um, I just want to kind of reflect back it's been about 10 probably 12 years when we did our long-range plan and that was one of the initiatives that we had was to improve our hiring of minority teachers and this was some of the initiatives that we've put in place and you kind of can see it coming now into to to uh um the things that we do for retention and recruitment and miss miss dorfield uh miss uh, uh durable danger field was one of the one of the uh employees that's been uh, highlighting that for us and, and being the front runner for us in those areas and and we've each year is is a a, a better year for us we keep keep uh, adding new schools into our system and we need teachers into our system and minority teachers are, are hard to find in all of these universities that we're at trying to get them because everybody in the nation is after the same teachers and so it's been a struggle for us in order to hire minority teachers and and we, we, we've been doing a, I wouldn't say a, 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 a excellent job, but we're doing a very good job at it. But, and, and our numbers this year, I think the number was 21. Correct. At, correct. To and, date it's and, and, and out of the amount of teachers that we're hiring the parish, uh, that's, that's still a small percentage. But, but we're doing a pretty good job. And, I, and I, I'd like to thank the board for, uh, for you all sticking behind this system, saying, yes, that was one of our long range goals, and that's why we wanted to see some emphasis in it. And thank you, board, for, for standing up saying, yes, that's what we want. We want inclusion. We want diversity. And I think that's what we're after. And, and thank you all, and thank you, Dora. Thank you. Ms. Chanigan. Thank you, Ms. Hines, Ms. Dangerfield. Can you just tell us the percentage of, uh, I know we hired less campus uh, or less teachers this year than last year. Huh? So right. and the numbers went up. So what, what's the percentage that you achieved of new hires? For minority students, minority teachers. We hired me. approximately 85 to 100 new teachers this year, and out of the 85 to 100, we hired uh, 21 minorities. Okay, well that's a good high percentage. It is. That's good. And uh, you mentioned retention. So, mm -hmm. is our retention? Do we have a problem with minority teachers from a retention standpoint, or how would you characterize that? Well, when we take a look at our retention data, I have been um, keeping the data since 2006. From 2006 to 2011, when you're looking at the data, we have about a 75% retention rate. Okay. And that compares to the overall population of? The overall population of our district, we have about an 80% retention rate each year. Okay. And nationally, the data says that teachers typically leave the teaching profession between three to five years, and when we look at our minority data, we're probably right there with it. Really? Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Ms. Seely. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hines. Ms. Dangerfield, the question I have is um, about what percentage were new graduates, if any, of the minority of teachers? The minority group. You know, surprisingly, you asked that. Out of the teachers that we hired, minority teachers, only three of them were new graduates. The rest of them came to us from other districts and from out of state, and all of them had years of experience. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah. All right, thank you very much for the compilation of the data and the presentation. We appreciate it. That brings us to instruction. Uh, Special Education Community Connections, Mrs. Ash. Okay, good evening. Uh, first tonight, I want to continue the community focus in reference to uh, what special education is doing to work towards communication and collaboration with parents of children with disabilities gifted and talented. 
Last year, the Special Education Department, with the help of Kelly Donaldson and Ron Barthet, we created an avenue of access for parents uh, of special education students to get information and updates via the St. Tammany Parish website. The site continues to grow with resources, information, and links for parents to be informed. Who would know better about parent connections than a parent themselves? So I'd like to introduce our parent liaison that we use in our special education departments, Dottie Davis. Ms. Dottie. And um, Dottie has grown the website uh, with a teacher web news flash subscription. She's posted two video PowerPoints that we've worked collaboratively with her on, with more to come. She's worked with resource links, website updates, and more. So right now, I want to just take a second to show you how to access that. So on the website, the, a parent would click parents, and we give parents these instructions at every IEP meeting so that they can go on, access the information, know how to access the news, the subscription. There's a special education button. Then over on the side, we have links, programs, staff information, acronyms. Uh, parent resources so that's the one I'm going to highlight tonight is the parent resources already we have two PowerPoint video links for parents to access and we've had a chance to even kind of show these at some of our parent sessions and there at the very bottom you see where it says teacher web news flash link and this is where they go on to subscribe so right now I'm just going to give you a quick little, I'm not going to show you the whole thing because they're only about four minutes long, but I just want you to kind of have an idea of what a parent would see. So they would click on this. Let's hope it all works. The IEP process. Ten things parents need to know. The IEP is a team process. As a parent, you are an essential member of the team. You are the expert on your child and have a unique role to play in the IEP process. Get to know your IEP team. Know the names of the people who provide services to your child and be sure to have an open communication either with them directly or through your child's teacher. Read the rights booklet. Learn about your child's rights regarding his education. Legislation regarding education for people with disabilities changes all the time. Be sure to stay on top of this for your child's sake. Communication is the key. You need to have a consistent mode of communication with your child's teacher. You need to be communicating with your child's teacher on a regular basis so that you're aware of his progress. And that's pretty much a, an example of what they look like. So ways for, quick ways for parents that, the next one about breaking down the IEP doc, documents goes through each document, gives a parent just a, uh, overview, not in a lot of detail, so that they feel comfortable when they come to IEPs. What does each form mean? What, what are some of the things that we're going to be looking at? So those are and it's easy ways that they can see it over and over again if they need to. In addition, we've partnered with North Shore Families Helping Families to um, give parent sessions in our community. We've already um, had two this fall. One was on the IEP process and another, we actually did a mock IEP where we had a team and we had many participants. We had parents, university students. Um, we also had outside agencies like um, CASA and um, the ECSS for the little children. So they all came because they want to be familiar too. What do I expect when I walk into an IEP? And we just finished eight sessions on the educational rights booklet because often parents have voiced that they feel like they want an in-depth in explanation of what is in the rights booklet they get at every IEP meeting. So that is our community connection report. Do we have any questions for Ms. Hosh about that? Right, so you're ready for that gifted and talented? I am. Report? I am ready to talk about gifted and talented now. Okay. In the I'm state of Louisiana, before oh, you begin, it looks Go like ahead. Mr. Alfred's thought of a question for you. Yes. Mr. Alfred. I did have one question. Yes, sir. The process for the IEP, mm -hmm. how fast does that process start to, for a parent to get their child through an IEP 
the initial set of that. How long does that take? You mean in reference to like being um, the conversation, like does the child you've have been, a disability? You've been identified and then now you have to have this session and how long does it take to get through that session <coughs> to get everything rolling? Once a, a child has an evaluation that says that they have an exceptionality, then for the first IEP there's a there's 30 days they're allowed 30 days that's getting the evaluations out to the teachers everybody gets a chance to read it schedule it it's a 30-day timeline for that first IEP after that the IEP has to be held at least every year if not more often so a person at the beginning of the year will start the year off not being addressed by the IEP because the IEP had been developed so they would lose at least 45 days something like that no, they shouldn't. If, if a child, you know, it takes 60 days to do an evaluation. 60 days. For an evaluation. And once the evaluation is complete, then they would hold the IEP. And if we're talking the very beginning of the school year, they're going to hold it quicker to make sure that that child's in the right class. Right, that's what I was trying to get Yes. At. I mean, they have 30, 30 days, but they're going to expedite that so that the child's in the right place. So we've been doing a pretty good job of trying to make sure that we, we for the for the person that hasn't been identified, for the ones that have been identified, they have an active IEP, so correct. they're being evaluated every so often with that. That is correct. There's re-evaluations every three years, and sometimes more often if needed. Okay. So we're doing a pretty good job with we're that. We're doing an excellent job. Thank you very much. Ms. Hosh, I believe Mr. Battencourt has come up Absolutely. with a question for you. Yeah, Mrs. Hosh, <clears throat> on that same subject, how is an IEP originally initiated? Does a parent have to request that, or does a teacher see a student in her classroom and say, wow, this child is exceptional, whatever, and needs an IEP, or is it both? Well, it, it starts a little bit before that, because they have to have an evaluation before they can have an IEP. So if a teacher either um, sees a child that has some struggles or is exceptional, um, in either way, you know, has some learning needs or exceptional and gifted or talented, they would um, go to the student assistance team, which is each school has a team, and talk about that and look at are there other interventions that they can do. If they feel like there's enough to refer the child for an evaluation, then the parent gives permission and that begins. So that takes approximately 60 days, all right? It's a multi-team approach. A lot of people do their thing. And then after that's finished, if the child does have an exceptionality, then they have an IEP, which could take 30 days. But again, it's going to be exp expedited depending on what time of year it is. But those are the timelines. Okay. Um can a parent also come to us initially and say, you know, my, my child needs an evaluation and an IEP or something? Absolutely. A parent can um, voice it to the school. They can send a letter to me and say that, you know, I've noticed my child is struggling. I'd really like an evaluation. And then we start having the conversation and, and getting it going. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Hosh, would you just mention Child Search? Sure. Child Search as well is um, an avenue that st the little ones, the three to five year olds, I mean, when they're not in a school, when they're not in a school where you have an, a student assistance team, the avenue is Child Search. And a lot of our Child Search little ones come through early steps. They've already been in process from birth to three. And then um, child search will make a smooth transition. They'll do an evaluation. So as soon as the child turns three years old, we have services for them on their third birthday. There's, that's seamless. And then um, other children that maybe didn't go through early steps, but maybe they're having some trouble with language or talking, they just call our office and make an appointment. And we have flyers out in doctor's offices, all in the community, um, preschools, daycares, where if any, again, a preschool identifies it or a parent, a lot of times grandparents will say to their, you know, I think he's a little delayed in talking or something, and then they'll have them call us. So child search is a big part of what we do. And also we work, child search is also an avenue for students that are in non-public schools. Because if they're in a non-public school, that would be our avenue for an SAT meeting because we would do an evaluation there as well. Thank you very much. Absolutely. 
All right. Now All I think right. we're ready for that gifted and talented. All right, gifted and talented. All right, I'm excited tonight to kind of have a chance to talk with you all and I have some awesome speakers with me this evening about gifted and talented. In the state of Louisiana, uh, identification of students with the exceptionality of gifted and talented follows regulations from Bulletin 1706 and because of that it falls under special education. So we deal with children with all kinds of exceptionalities. Both gifted and talented offer programs that are designed to meet the individual needs of students based on students individual education program or what we know as the IEP. So even in um, the gifted and talented programs those children have an IEP. So what is the gifted program? It serves students from pre-k through 12 who meet the criteria for exceptionality as established by the Louisiana Department of Education. Gifted children are, uh, and youth are students who demonstrate abilities that give evidence of high performance in academic and intellectual aptitude. The characteristics fall in the areas of cognitive, social, emotional, and language. You know, a lot of times in a gifted child, these are the areas that we see a difference. Some of their characteristics are they're concerned about fairness and justice, injustice. There can be, now, not all of them, but a lot of them can be perfectionist, energetic, well-developed, they have a well-developed sense of humor. They like to be around parents, teachers, adults, very observant, they're extremely curious, they're, they have intense interest, excellent memory, and long attention spans, and excellent reasoning skills, plus some other, other exceptional characteristics. Um, in our gifted programs, we have two gifted models. We have an academic model, which is grades two through 12, an enrichment model, we kind of we have the pre-K, kindergarten through first, and then the second through six. So these are two different models that we have in the program. The academic model is designed for those students who are working significantly above grade level in math and or reading. The academic model allows for students to move beyond the regular education curriculum that he or she has already mastered. The academic model follows an on grade level curriculum written specifically for gifted students for fo to focus on common core standards and GLEs. Now the enrichment model is designed to enhance productive thinking skills. The model allows students to master on grade level and regular education class skills while developing thinking skills and gifted. The enrichment model follows an enriched curriculum that encourages project-based <coughs> learning. And you're going to see a little example of that tonight. It also encourages the student interest. Students have the opportunity to develop thinking skills and the greatest asset where they're not stressed and they haven't maybe been able to develop elsewhere. We have 132 teachers of the gifted. I always have to be careful when I say that. I say gifted teachers, they're teachers of the gifted because they're all gifted teachers. And we have over 2,000 students in our gifted program. So tonight first, I'm gonna introduce some of our special guest speakers. We have Suzanne Pichon, who is a teacher of the gifted and also our teacher of the year for our elementary, St. Tammany Parish from Bonnie Cole. So Suzanne. We're going to get you an office up here if you keep coming to all these meetings. <laughs> Good evening, and thank you again for allowing me to come speak to you about the gifted program this time. I've been working with in St. Tammany Parish since 1997, and 13 of those years have been in the gifted program, and I've been working in the academic model program the whole time. And as Sharon said, those students are working significantly above grade level at an accelerated pace. And our students are encouraged to think at higher levels where they're analyzing, synthesizing, and evaluating information. In my instruction, I encourage problem solving all the way, including solving problems we find within our classroom. We have to stop and solve them, figure out how to do that. Understanding how to apply what we're learning in the classroom to the real world. They want to know why this is important, and so I need to show them that. They need to know that, because they're going to ask why. Also, giving them you know, choice in their assessment methods. It's not always going to be the same way. It's going to look very different for them. And then in-depth studies. They get very intrigued and excited about things and just giving them the opportunity to do that. And 
by adopting the Common Core Standards, it's allowed us to challenge our students, deepen their understanding, and help them accelerate their learning. And one of the biggest misconceptions of gifted students is that they're all well behaved and they sit with their little hands folded and they're just so excited to learn. That's not the case. That's more the exception than the rule. I can say that because I do have a child in the gifted program, so I can say that. It's okay. But having grown up in the gifted program myself, too, I am able to understand the unique feelings that these students battle. They're so smart, but yet you know, they might be at a different social level and they may feel different from other students. So this allows me just having a child in the program, going through it myself, just to relate to their social and emotional needs because they're very unique and they're very different. And part of my job is to educate the regular education teachers about that. And that has to connect with their academic needs because they need to know that they do think differently and they feel differently. They feel deeper about things. Just as Sharon said, that sense of justice Oh, almost every one of mine has that. You know, this was wrong and this was why. You know, they're going to tell you about that. But each year, my classroom is it's different every single year. There's not a typical gifted classroom. From year to year, my classroom changes and it stretches me as a teacher. So I'm always having to find new ways to challenge them. And a few years ago, when I was, I had a sixth grade group, and I had a group of boys in there that did not like to read. They were like, we are not going to read. And I was their reading teacher. I said, yes, we are going to read. So we had times where they had individual reading time. So instead of me saying, this is what you're going to do, they were able to choose their, make their own goals and choose what they were going to do. And one student fell in love with the Titanic. We read one story, and then he read every single book he could find on the Titanic. And I would sit and meet with him, and he was so engaged in reading. Reading. So by the end of the year, reading was his favorite subject. So it's just exciting to see that change when you tap into what they really need and you really get to know them and you work through the emotional issues that are hard. And you know, also technology is a huge focus that we have in our classrooms and in the gifted program that works so well. And I've been blessed to have the opportunity to write a lot of grants so I'm able to have laptops for all of my students iPods for them to use and so we use those on a daily basis and I was able to write a grant a few years ago we were able to read books on the iPods so we read them the kids took notes on it they were completely engaged and one of the boys who you know again was another one I had to challenge he said you just combined two of my favorite things I love to read and I love technology because this was the best thing we've ever done so he was so excited about that but just as a teacher, giving them choice, giving them input in the activities that they do makes them want to come to class every single day. It challenges them, but it also makes for an enjoyable place for both of us to be. Thank you very much. And next, what we're going to do is we're going to be watching a video about the enrichment model here in St. Tammany Parish. We are doing a, uh, doing a race from Karoos and Boracay. This is a on made, a made up state, I mean, con um, the continents of Andoria. And we're racing from Karoos and Boracay all the way to Morgantown and Borgania. Our name is the fight team. Uh, this is our third fight plan. We got the date, we got the team color, and their name. <laughs> then we also have fake cards that we pull to if like we get extra when we get to travel extra far if we, we get something bad something bad we happens get, we lose and mileage or we miss a day and and this is our diary entry and we write it to get points. Uh, next one we got was three hundred and our the last one, one we got was five hundred the highest you can get. Fly ahead. Well, maybe get there, then we have there, and then we have our destination. Our, that's where the finish line is. And that's an example of the Richmond program. Okay, now we have a special guest who is a student from the gifted program from Covenant High School. Jaden is a senior at Covenant High School, so he's going to share his perspective. <clears throat> Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to come and speak to you tonight. My name is Jaden Gillespie, and I would like to tell you about my history with the gifted program. I was placed in the gifted program in the first grade 
and that has been one of the most life-changing things to ever happen to me. Being in Gifted has given me the chance to be challenged, to exercise my curiosity, and to expend my creative energy. In my regular classrooms, I never found myself being challenged. It was interesting, but I wasn't putting forth any effort. To this day, it has been my gifted classes that have challenged me and pushed me to break old limits. My gifted teachers taught me how to think and were able to take the time to focus on my individual needs. I remember in my second year in the gifted program, my instructor, Miss Spears, asked me to write a paper about myself without using the word I more than once. I had trouble with that assignment, but I realized over the years that that kind of challenge is what I loved. It's not just about the academics. I have had so many gifted teachers who have taken the time to work with me on the character traits that I will need to succeed in the adult world. If the gifted program did not exist, I can confidently say that I would not have pushed myself, would not have learned to love a challenge, and will not have had the countless engaging discussions with my teachers and peers that have molded me into the journeyman learner that I have become. The gifted program has let me explore many different avenues of learning, discover my own capabilities, and has afforded me the chance to work with peers who love to compete and want to be challenged just like myself. Being in gifted has opened many closed doors for me. Currently, I am seeking a nomination to attend one of the United States military academies. I believe my gifted classes and teachers have prepared me well for this endeavor, and I have high hopes for my future. I am completely grateful to St. Tammany Parish that I have had the blessing of the gifted program. Thank you very much. We have high hopes for you too, Jaden. Yeah. Thank you. And did Jaden's teacher make it, Ms. Martin? There she is, right back there, Eugenia Martin. So great. One thing I did want to mention, because um, uh, I'm getting ready to go to the talent now, talent side, uh, a student can um, be eligible as gifted. You know, they're tested in the area of language, math, and intelligence. And they can qualify for gifted and intelligence alone. And a lot of times that's where that enrichment program is so important, working on those productive thinking skills while they're still working on the math and the English skills in the classroom. Okay, so what is the Talented Arts Program? Serve students grades K through 12. They have to meet the eligibility criteria set out by Bulletin 1706 and 1508, established by the Louisiana Department of Education. A student has, the talent is defined as a possession of demonstrated abilities that give evidence of high performance and visual and or performing arts. So either the visual arts or the performing arts, theater or music. They're exception, they have an exceptional ability in art, music, or theater. They have an intense, intense appreciation of these arts. They have a sensitivity, intuitiveness, and responding emotionally to people, events, and art forms. They are highly creative thinkers and have a vivid imagination. Ability to demonstrate feelings and emotions through the arts, ability to view and express things from an unusual perspective, and they're self-motivated and have an intense power of concentration when it comes to completing a work in the art, whether it's visual arts, music, or theater. <coughs> and there's many more. You know, a lot of times, you know, we have a lot of great students in art, music, and theater but there's some exceptionality <coughs> criteria that kind of sets children apart through the, the, the Bulletin 1706 criteria, and that is some of them. The models are in Richmond again, K through eight, and our academic models are in the high school. <coughs> Often we see the final performance product as students, but there's a wealth of instruction that goes on the final product, whether it's the enrichment program or the high school program. And I know we've benefited a lot from seeing these performances here at the school board. When we talk about the instruction that goes on in the talented classroom, they all disciplines, whether it's art, music, or theater, include instruction on history, analysis and criticism, creative expression, 
career opportunities in technology. And of course, the creative expression is the part where the performance, the part that we see. Currently, we have 47 and a half teachers of the talented and over 2,100 students in our talented program. So first tonight, you're going to hear from Brina Fashon, who's a talented music teacher at um, Fountain Blue High, Mandeville Junior, and St. Tammany Junior. Thank you, Ms. Hosh. Good evening. I'm honored to be here with you this evening to have a moment to speak um, about the Talented Music Program. Our classes seek to educate the whole musical child for a broad range of success. In this age of information, our classes are designed uh, with higher order thinking, creating, and raising the bar for student achievement. Small class sizes allow ample individual instruction and encouragement. Music is a part of our lives and sometimes we don't even notice it while we're shopping on television and the movies. We prepare our students to be a vital part of a multifaceted music industry to have a sustainable career which impacts the lives of people in our communities and beyond. In my classes, you'll hear a variety of instruments and voices. Piano and violin soloists work their sonatas. Clarinets and trumpets practice scales and etudes for upcoming auditions. Vocalists sing through a steady routine of warm-ups to hit those high notes while snare drummers tap out their rudiments. Often, students are giving a recital or concert for one another and offering feedback and encouragement on how to improve for the next big performance. Our talented music classes provide our students a collaborative environment to organize themselves into groups for improvised jam sessions, classical chamber ensembles, or jazz trios. We incorporate a music theory curriculum to help our students learn how to read, write, and understand the musical language, which they then use to analyze and create their own musical compositions. Piano fundamentals are taught and critical listening skills are emphasized with ear training and listening activities. We introduce the many musical masterpieces from Bach and Beethoven to Ellington and Gershwin. My favorite lessons are always those that focus on our local music traditions and culture. One day the sounds of operatic voices might be greeting students through the door. The next, the brassy glissandos of trombone shorty. Curiosity and excitement about music drives me and the students to look forward to that next, next class. Some time ago, an eighth grader was about to quit playing her instrument because she didn't think it was the popular thing to do anymore. And carrying that case around school was no longer any fun. The talented music program teacher talked of scholarships and urged her to attend summer camps. How could she quit when that class offered a safe place to be a beginner all over again and learn the piano or flute? Why would she quit and miss out on the talented music program field trips to hear the Louisiana Philharmonic Orchestra? How could she give up an opportunity to be featured on a program with friends performing all the challenging music she worked hours to perfect? How could she quit when it was the one class she looked forward to more than any other? Well, she didn't quit. I didn't quit. I was that student at St. Tammany Junior High, and I stand before you now with passion for music and enthusiasm to share it with my students. The Talented Music Program has helped prepare many for success as music majors in college. Even if they do not major in music, we have given them tools to be good consumers of music and skills to be arts advocates in their communities. There is so much value in the Talented Music Programs in St. Tammany our students have an opportunity to truly shine. As a former student, I'd like to thank you for those opportunities. And as a St. Tammany Parish Talented Music Program teacher, thank you for your support. Um, next, I'd like to introduce one of my colleagues, Scott Sauber. He is a talented theater teacher at Slidell High and uh, Bonnie Cole. Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As they said, my name is Scott Sauber. I'm a talented theater program teacher in the St. Tammany Parish Talented Arts Program. And in 14 years of teaching in 10 different schools, including five years at Fountain Blue High and nine years at my current home, Slidell High School, I've had the pleasure of sharing classrooms at Mandeville Middle, Abita Middle and Elementary, Lyon Elementary, Pineview Middle, Little Oak, Whispering Forest, and currently Bonnie Cole Elementary. 
I am proud to explain this evening what is happening when you peek through our classroom window and into our world. First thing in the morning, you may wander in on a physical warm-up. Students in a circle using their whole body to throw an imaginary ball of energy around the room. A highly interactive game of improv freeze tag. A runaround session of pantomime. Animal walks, rhythmic exercises, each game with a particular focus on using our physical bodies to create a range of characters and live a life of experiences that perhaps we've only imagined up until then. Warm up exercises build an ensemble and prepare us physically because characters that we play don't walk the way that we walk. By late morning, you may glimpse a moment of table work. Young actors study theater vocabulary, historical and modern playwrights, proven methods of our craft as defined by famous teachers throughout history, such as Stanislavski, Meisner, Spolin, and of course, Sauber. <laughs> theater history takes over as we analyze a script in preparation for performance. Perhaps we're dissecting a monologue, making choices and creating actions for our characters, discovering context in the language, or even writing the next Pulitzer Prize winning work in our very own classrooms. The intense study of our craft helps build an understanding of the world around us and prepares us mentally because most of the characters that we play do not talk the way that we talk. By early afternoon, students are on their feet. A rehearsal becomes an exacting science. Aside from the task of memorizing lines and perfecting stage movements, you build relationships with your own character as well as the others on stage. We fully enhance our productions by building, crafting, taping, gluing, painting, and decorating scenery to transport the audience. Cutting, sewing, enhancing, deconstructing, and layering all the right costume pieces sometimes range from historical hairdos and period clothing to dad's old suit with some well-placed safety pins to iron-on letters and carefully coordinated t-shirts. We round out the afternoon with lighting effects to set the mood and blackouts to allow our dedicated stage crew to finesse the set change in the dark for perfect transformation. Technical skills enhance the performance and transport the cast because these characters that we play <laughs> don't always think the way that we think. By the afternoon, rehearsals are behind us and the curtain is in front. The last bit of nerves are calmed as we bring ourselves back to the focus of the warm-up game. The remaining questions will all be answered live in front of an audience as we employ Stanislavski's method of emotional recall and Meisner's task of playing the action truthfully. The actors are dressed, the lighting is set, the tech crew await their cue, and the teacher finally breathes that sigh of relief. Here's where you come in now appearing live on stage. The St. Tammany Talented Arts Program. Curtain up, all we need is your applause. <laughs> Thank you. And now I'm gonna transition to a video that features uh, one of our talented music teachers teaching in his classroom. If I can employ my technology, there we go. This is Brian Strain from Let's Lake Harbor Middle show. School. We studied about him today. We listened to his, his work of music. We're going to pretend that we're going to write our, our, a piece like him. OK. How many beats do we have left in that measure now? Two. Two beats. And so you want a quarter note G. You want a quarter note G. Tom, we give it a try. Mm -hmm. You want to try C? OK. And what type of note would you like? A quarter note or an eighth note? Okay, an eighth note. What would you like to put and what type of note value would you like to use? I, I like to put a G because it goes like. And you want to go, A is definitely in the chord. Ooh, I like that. When I put the C here, see if you can notice what happens. What happened to the notes? They can, they can make the okay, so it should be easy. What are our note choices now? Dominique? Uh, C, E, and G. I actually wrote it down before. I love it. You're getting paid. That's great. So, Dominique, since you named the notes, why don't you go ahead and tell me what do you think we should put there? Okay? Uh, I think we should start over, so we should go back to the notes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you want to use repetition like we talked about earlier. You want to start over again. Let's try that. Four, one, two, three, four, 
student from North Shore High School. Emma is a sophomore at North Shore High School and she's going to talk to a little bit about her um, works in the visual arts program and she's also a talented um, art student, a, talent, a theater student as well. So Emma? Hello, my name is Emma Landish and I have been in talented visual art since third grade. I'm currently a, a sophomore at North Shore High School and I'd like to share what being in the program has meant to me over the years. It's kind of hard for me to remember when I was first screened, but I had brought a, a portfolio of drawings and was take then was taken to a room where I was quizzed on my artistic knowledge. It was a little scary the first time I was screened, but by the second time when I had passed through the first, I had gained a little more confidence. During elementary, middle, and junior high, we only had talented art once a week. It was always my favorite class, and I remember that I liked it so much because I had more freedom and I could use my own creativity instead of in the regular art classrooms. Um, now that I have talented art every day in high school, I can learn a little more about making art. We were doing a unit on watercolor, and Mr. Schwartz had taught us, you know, techniques that I didn't even know existed with watercolor. Um, talented art can be fun, but it's also challenging. During the same watercolor unit, I had been working on a piece that I thought was going very well. But during the in-progress um, critique, some of my fellow classmates had told me some things that could make the piece look a lot better and it came out looking well. Um, the first piece I brought to show you tonight is on the left, and it's called Bolero. A couple, about a year ago, I had gone to a friend of mine's dance recital, and she had done a ballet dance that was called Bolero. I really liked the costume that she wore, so I decided to draw and um, paint this. Um, the second piece, the charcoal portrait of the girl, is one that I'm making for a friend. Um, right after an English exam, I had been drawing something a little similar, and she saw it, and she liked it, so she asked me to make something kind of similar but different. Um, I'm also in the Talented Theater program. Um, we are working on a production of Blythe Spirit, which will be in January. Um, as you can see, Talented Arts has been a big part of my educational experience, and I love it. Thank you. Thank you. And I know Emma has her mom with her this evening, and also her teacher, Mr. Schwartz. So thank you all for thank coming. Thank you for being here, and thank you, Emma. OK. Um, real quick, before we start doing the other one, I do want to um, we do have two coordinators of these programs. Marianne Smith is the coordinator of the Gifted program, and Debbie LaFour is the coordinator of the Talented program. And um, they both were not able to be here this evening. But Donna Laurent, who's the assistant coordinator of the Talented program right over here, was able to be here. And I do appreciate all the input from the teachers and the students this evening. Did a great job. Who can say more about the program than the ones that are teaching and taking the classes from it? All right, so now. <laughs> Yeah. 
a glimpse of our first annual Talented Arts Showcase that was just recently held at Coop Drive. So I don't know if any of you were able to go out there, but it was a beautiful day and it was a great opportunity and we look to have this as an annual event to have every year because I know the teachers and the students enjoyed it. So gifted and talented is a very special part of special education. That concludes my presentation. Thank you very much, Ms. Hosh. Let's see if we have any questions or comments from board members. Ms. Seeley? I have a couple of comments. Thank you, Ms. Heinz. Ms. Hosh, mm -hmm. our PTA, our local PTA, has been an integral part in um, providing, uh, through our National for Reflections program, many um, of the students um, have been chosen by um, being recognized through this program into the Talented Arts. Mm -hmm. And it's been great to see how many children came through this venue. And number two, I had the honor of attending this recent event on Coop Drive and ended up staying all day and emptying my pocketbook out because we had so many talented students out there that were that had displays of um, projects that were on for sale and you had to go to a ticket booth and I was constantly going back to the ticket booth almost brought the items tonight because I was so impressed with what they could do and I hope that that program continues mm -hmm. because it was on um, it was a fantastic event mm -hmm. and I enjoyed the talent I enjoyed um, the talent on stage and off stage, mm -hmm. and I'm so proud of our students and our program, and thank you so much for heading this up. Absolutely, thank you very much. All right. Mr. Battencourt? Thank you. This looks like such a challenge. How do the teachers of these gifted, talented students give out grades? How do you come up with an A or a B? Well, they have guidelines, and you know, it's, t it's tougher. They have guidelines that they have to follow in reference to that. It's part of the curriculum and the instruction, just like um, a, a, di a different class or an honors class or a regular education class. But the, the expectations are different. But they, I mean, they do it. It must be, the expectations must be very, very mm -hmm. different. It just seems it would, it would almost be impossible to give a child a particular grade when you see that you know they're putting out such effort how that doesn't measure up to be whatever an A or a B or something yeah, that's kind of intriguing to me thank you you're welcome any other questions or comments from board members mr. Alfred I just love that uh, when we have our meetings on the first I mean the second Thursday and the half hour before the meetings that mm -hmm. they come in and perform before us, they do an excellent job. And then all the art, the, the paint work that we put up mm -hmm. on the walls, uh, they, it's just so, we just have so much talent here in St. Tammany, it's unbelievable. We do. Great job, teachers. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hosh. Thank you. And thank you to the students and teachers who came tonight for the presentation. We appreciate it very much. All right, um, announcements from the president. Mr. Luke. Thank you, Ms. Hines. Schools will close the week of November 19th through the 23rd for Thanksgiving holiday. Offices will close Wednesday, November 21st at noon through Friday, November 23rd. Committees to hold meeting for Business Affairs Administration will be held on Thursday, December 6th, 7 p.m. here in the C.J. Shane Complex. We'd like to recognize the beautiful artwork that's on display in the atrium. The artwork was done by students from Lakeshore High School. Their elective art teacher is Ms. Christine Geraci. Thank you. 
Right, thank you very much. And again, I'd like to say thank you to the university students who are here with you, with us tonight. And you can see that we have a lot going on in St. Tammany schools, and we appreciate you being here for our meeting. And we hope our staff has a, and everyone has a great Thanksgiving. Thank you very much for coming. Meeting adjourned.